Dr. Hunt is an assistant research scientist at the University of Georgia Center for Applied Isotope Studies, which does radiocarbon dating, x-ray fluorescence spectrometry, aquatic environmental programs, and a host of other things. Uh, Dr. Hunt is an archaeological materials scientist, petrologist, and geochemist with research interests that include raw materials characterizations, the development of analytical methods for material analysis, and reconstructing ancient technologies. She received her PhD from University College London Institute of Archaeology. She speaks nine languages and has done field research throughout the Middle and the Near East. She is widely published in academic journals and is the author of the newly published Palace Wear Across the Neo-Assyrian Imperial Landscape, which is the topic of tonight's talk. Please welcome Dr. Alice Hunt. I'm going to correct that. I read nine languages. <laughs> A lot of them are dead, so I don't actually speak them. <laughs> But thank you very much to Van and, and Madeline for um, inviting me. Before I really start into the guts of um, my talk, I want to explain a little bit about how I approach my research and, and my world, because I have two hats. I'm an anthropologist, um, so I study people, but I'm also a materials engineer, which means I look at how things are, are made and built. So. What I'm most passionate about is how social identities are negotiated and maintained through material culture. Um, and to get there, I use um, <clears throat> a whole lot of science and a whole lot of numbers and nitpicky little details. Because so I like to have the material speak to me through those chemical and physical attributes and tell me about how they were valued and used by um, their consumers. So what I am going to do tonight, don't be afraid, is give you a whole lot of frosting with just enough cake to hold the frosting together and, and, and have it make some sense. Um, but there will be a quiz at the end. So at its most basic, my talk tonight is about the palaceware problem. Palaceware is an 8th to 7th century BCE drabware or plainware and quite simply, the palace wear problem is how and why did palace wear occur across the neo Assyrian imperial landscape? Now, most imperial and colonial interactions are in some way constructed based on world systems theory, which is a model of economic interaction. The core are the rich technologically developed countries, the periphery are the poor dependent economically dependent countries, and the semi-periphery are these semi-developed, semi-independent countries. However, we're talking about a pre-industrial context, so the descriptions could be modified to an international economy and an international political identity, local economies and local politics, and national but not quite international identities. According to world systems theory, high prestige goods or materials move from the core where they're manufactured to these other regions, either because they are exchanged in the semi-periphery or because they are emulated in the periphery. Thus, there is the equation of core material culture equals core identity. There is value to this model. And it does offer an explanation for the presence of palace wear across the Assyrian landscape. However, it's problematic because world systems theory is connected to dependence theory, which means that the core is dependent upon an underdeveloped periphery and the periphery is dependent on the core for economic stability. During the time period we're talking about, although these borders will shift and change throughout time, every one of the regions highlighted in blue was an independent national or international economic and political identity. 
It was a world full of cores and semi-peripheries, to use those world system theories definitions. Each of these national identities was involved in complex interregional and international relationships. And while they were interdependent economically, they were not entirely dependent upon one another. So how are we then to understand the diffusion of material culture across the Assyrian imperial landscape if we don't use world systems theory? I believe that material culture is the medium through which social and political identities can be negotiated, established, and maintained. So we cannot understand the function of these vessels um, in all parts of an imperial landscape in the same way. As such, Assyrian material culture in general, and palaceware in particular, must be located within a particular narrative of the region or the population of consumers, producers, and its cultural audience. So to begin our narrative, we need to understand more about the Assyrians and their empire. Assyria first became a political cultural identity tied to a specific geography, because there's a difference between the land and the cultural identity or the political identity, particularly in the Near East. Um, land changes hands frequently, but cultural identities stay the same. Beginning of the 19th century BCE, geographically, Assyria is located in northern Mesopotamia in what is modern Iraq and Kurdistan. Um, Mosul and Arbil are two of the ancient cities that um, we can still locate on the map. The Middle and Bronze Ages were a turbulent time in the Middle East in general, and while Assyria remained a player on the political scene, the, uh, the, it experienced about two to three hundred years of instability um, before regaining its independence, where it was occupied by the Arameans. The transition between the late Bronze and early Iron Age was marked by a dramatic climactic change as well. Much of the Middle Assyrian territorial holdings were lost, and at the start of the Neo-Assyrian period, Assyria had been reduced to its original geographic region, what I will refer to as the home provinces. And on your handout, those home provinces are marked in the dark blue color. Those provinces were territories, were geographies that were always culturally and politically Assyrian. Unlike many other Eastern uh, cultures, the Assyrian king was not a god or divine in any way. Rather, he was simply a high priest and the representative of the god Ashur on earth. The word Assyrian actually means of Ashur. The role as high priest, the king was required to extend the power and the might of Ashur. This meant both increasing the land of Assyria through annual campaigns and the annexation of territory, but by also increasing the diversity of Ashur through flora, fauna, arts, culture, languages over which Ashur could become sovereign. As you might guess, this creates an ideological tension because on the one hand, in order to administrate an empire, there needs to be a certain degree of homogeneity in terms of cultural and social practice. But on the other hand, the imperial ideology requires diversity, which needs to be encouraged because displays of diversity within the empire increase the power and the presence and the prestige of the god. For example, um, public gardens were set up um, at most of the imperial capital cities. And there were gardeners imported to care for the diversity of exotic flora and fauna throughout the empire. Here's a drawing kind of emphasizing one of these gardens. Now, these types of, of gardens are probably what um, is later referred to as those hanging gardens in Babylon. The Neo-Babylonians took over, took over this model. Tribute could also be paid in the form of exotic animals and plants, um, which were also, these menagerie were also displayed for public consumption uh, throughout the empire. And this is actually from a palace relief from Nimrud. Um, so these are monkeys being brought uh, from Arabia. 
But the ideology of conspicuous consumption was an integral part of all aspects of Assyrian imperial ideology, from public architecture, this is the Ashur Gate at the city of Ashur, and this is the Nurgle Gate at the city of Nineveh, to the elaborative decoration of imperial spaces, including carved pavements, molded and sculpted walls, glazed brick tiles, and column knobs. and color. Assyrian imperial and administrative buildings were kaleidoscopes of color in a fairly uniform world of desert greens and browns. Although most of the glazed bricks are faded and corroded, chemical analysis of the colorants enables us to reconstruct the brilliance of these copper and cobalt blues, the lead antimony yellows and the iron reds. Even everyday objects such as cups and water jars, were glazed in brilliant colors. And the empire was not without luxury and luxury goods, ivory-backed chairs, ivory plaques, gold drinking cups, jars carved from precious stones and glass. Which brings us back to the palaceware problem. Of all the beautiful color luxury and everyday goods available in Assyria, why is it these drabware vessels that are valued in and across such a landscape of conspicuous consumption? The spread of palaceware across the imperial landscape and beyond is correlated with the annexation of territory into the empire or provincial system. All of Assyria was organized into these administrative provinces with its own governor, treasurer, military, and economic bureaus. The spread of palaceware has been interpreted as the imposition of imperial material culture on the annexed provinces and or understood as the Assyrian material culture being brought with provincial governors. But these interpretations are based on world systems theory. And as we talked about earlier, world systems theory doesn't quite fit the situation we have going on in the Near East at the time. Instead, we need to look at a recursive narrative-driven approach. Seeing material culture as an imposition of identity, understands that it, but understand that it, instead that it is a medium through which identity can be negotiated. In this study, we are going to focus and explore the narratives of two of the annexed provinces, or more specifically their capital cities, Guzana, and Durkat Limu, and one site outside of the Neo-Assyrian imperial system, Tel Gemma. Each of these cities has a very different and unique relationship and history with the Assyrian Empire. The three home provinces discussed are Ashur, Nimrud, and Nineveh. Ashur is the one on the bottom, and then they go Nimrud, Nineveh as you work your way up. Um, but all of these cities are roughly the same size, which is why they make for an interesting, interesting comparison. So how are we going to talk about social value, meaning, and take a narrative approach when we're studying pottery? Well, first, we need to think about what are the potential mechanisms that could have transported the pottery throughout the empire? And the, it could have moved as an object, either by trade or by having been carried by one of the provincial governors. The consumers of the vessels could have moved to a new location, requiring their production in the new location. The producers, the potters themselves, may have been itinerant and may have moved throughout the empire, thus producing palaceware wherever they went. Or it could have traveled as an idea or social practice. Hey, when I was visiting over in uh, Nimrud, they had this really cool thing. I'm wondering if you could make something like that. The easiest of these mechanisms to test from a material science point of view is the movement of the object itself. And that's because a raw material has kind of a, a chemical and, and mineralogical signature. So materials made from the same, pots made from the same raw materials will have similar signatures. Pots made from different raw material sources will often have different chemical signatures. When we look at the bulk chemical analysis of the uh, palaceware, we find that it was not traded, 
but was always locally manufactured. In fact, even in the home provinces, things split apart. And we can see that where we could expect one workshop for Nimrud and Nineveh, we actually have what look like three local workshops within those two cities. So if it didn't move as an object, that leaves us with consumers, producers, and social practice. So to evaluate these mechanisms, we need to take a closer look at the palace ware itself, how it was made, and what its formal and fabric characteristics are. Part of the palace ware problem is the fact that no definitional criteria exist or existed for palace ware until my book. <laughs> so what does it mean to be palace ware? In order to identify uh, the identity and meaning that these vessels had for their, for their consumers, the criteria need not just be unique to the vessel themselves, but be intentionally created by that cultural audience. So you see the difference here? It's not simply that it needs to have some feature that only it has and no other bull has, because that feature could be an accident of something else they were trying to do. We need to find a way to discover the intentionality of that particular characteristic being reproduced. It's not easy. One of the ways we get at that, however, is through morphometric analysis. Morphometric analysis is simply the formal description of objects based on measures of height, width, and angle. So here are some of the types of places where I would take metrics. Uh, rim diameter, neck diameter, vessel height, body height, shoulder angle, base body interaction angle, the angle that the lip comes off the rim, lots of numbers. An important metric for our particular analysis is capacity, which in this case I calculated as the sum of a series of frustums, which are uh, conic sections, as opposed to traditional cylinders. And that's because the shape, the conic shape, fits the vessel shape much better, and so it gives me a, a tighter, more accurate number. Attributes, morphometric attributes that are naturally related, things like body length and vessel height, as body length increases, we expect the overall vessel height to also increase. That's a natural relationship. And those relationships show up on biplots either as a linear behavior or an asymptotic behavior. Attributes that do not correlate naturally form discrete groups or clusters of data. And they signify intentional human behavior. These are the morphometric relationships that tell us about a vessel's practical, social, and symbolic function. Palace ware vessels were extremely well-made and uniform. Typically, in a complex society, vessels are considered standardized if the variability in the morphometric measurements from vessels within multiple workshops just humor me on this, is less than two standard deviations of the variability of morphometrics from a single workshop. So basically, it's standardized if the variability between workshops isn't significantly greater than the variability in a single workshop. In the case of palaceware, there is no statistically detectable difference between palaceware made anywhere in those home provinces, between those three cities and potentially the two workshops uh, in the one city. Therefore, they could have all been manufactured by the same potter, except as we've seen, the raw materials are different. So this is an incredibly well understood form by its producers. This careful form and fabrication also indicate that there's something socially significant about this pottery. The average tablewares also have standard forms, but the variation in Neo-Assyrian tablewares is all over the map. Um, it has quite a high standard deviation. So there's something specific about this wear. And these three attributes that I have here, neck length, body length, and capacity, enabled us to identify three basic palace wear forms 
bowls, cups, and jars, each with several subforms. This limited range of forms is interesting, particularly since none of them are unique to the Neo-Assyrian period, except perhaps the form A bowls. All the rest of these are standard Assyrian forms that date back to the Middle Assyrian period. What is unique is the combination of palaceware form and fabric. These vessels, unlike typical Assyrian vessels, are incredibly thin. They're referred to as eggshell thin in the oldest literature. The mode is 0.2 centimeters. So just, I mean, they're incredibly, incredibly fine grained. It is extremely difficult to produce a vessel this thin. What they would have done is thrown a form and then thinned it out putting it back on the wheel, and to thin it to this thickness, this tiny thickness on a wheel without the vessel failing, without either getting the rib through the vessel wall or having the vessel collapse, is, took incredible skill. Not to mention the fact that the thinner the vessel is, the more difficult it is to fire. The fabric of these vessels is incredibly fine-grained. I know that most of you aren't used to looking at micrographs, so take my word for it. This is an incredibly fine-grained vessel. What you see as white here, those aren't inclusions. Those are that's just pore space. There are hardly any mineral inclusions at all um, in, this, in this fabric. And you can see from this graph down here um, that there's a truncation in size of particles that are in the vessels. This indicates human behavior. Even a really, really fine-grained natural sediment has, you know, multiple modes and it kind of dribbles down nicely. This drops off, absolutely cuts off at the, around the small sand and, and silt size. And that indicates that the raw materials were probably processed through what's called sedimentation. They were mixed with water, put in a tank, and the heavy particles allowed to settle to the bottom. Palisware, these clays are a calcareous raw material. They occur in the buff and green colors only. Now that is indicative of firing temperature for us because calcium carbonate, which is what's primarily giving it the calcium in the structure decomposes around 750 degrees, producing lime within the ceramic body that forms white calcium silicates or pale yellow calcium ferrosilicates at about 1,000 degrees Celsius. It vitrifies into that pale green color at about 1,100 degrees Celsius. The trick is calcareous Ceramics, if anyone's a potter in here, you know that calcareous materials are tough. They are structurally incredibly stable until about 1050, when all of a sudden they collapse. So you won't know you're in trouble as the vessel vitrifies, 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 and then all of a sudden it'll slump in your kiln. Um, so calcareous clays are tough. So the skill required to produce this color and to intentionally keep reproducing this difficult color over and over again seems to indicate that there's something socially significant about this buff green color. The degree of vitrification shown by this diagnostic kind of honeycomb texture of palaceware fabrics confirms the high degree of pyrotechnical control and a firing temperature between 1050 and 1100 degrees Celsius. For comparison, Typical Neo-Assyrian tablewares were only fired to about 850. Another indication of the social significance of this material is that given the size and efficiency of Neo-Assyrian kilns based on the excavated examples, it would require 3.5 kilograms of biomass fuel. That's dung, wood, chaff, some kind of bio-based fuel per kilogram of ceramic material to reach and maintain a firing temperature of 1100 degrees Celsius. The average heating chamber floor was 3.4 meters squared, making the average palaceware load 
potentially up to 17 kilograms of ceramic material. Therefore, it would require approximately 133 pounds of fuel to fire a kiln full of palace ware to reach and maintain the temperature necessary to generate that color and those vitrification features. So why are the Assyrians investing time and money into the manufacture of these drab wares when there are so many flashy, really cool things they could be investing their time and energy in otherwise? I believe the answer to that is the particular social function and symbolic value of these vessels. One of the most striking characteristics of palace ware is that it occurs in discrete volume clusters. Two of the forms, form A bowls and form B cups, overlap in volume. As you can see, we've got two different forms here and they have pretty similar volumes. Generally, since form follows function, the form of palace ware suggests that they were drinking vessels involved in the consumption of liquids, which would also be consistent with a highly vitrified fabric because that would provide an impermeable boundary. These particular volumes are socially significant is indicated by their compatibility with Neo-Assyrian liquid measures, the kasu and the ku known from the cuneiform literature and particularly the Nimwood, Nimrud wine lists where these particular six kasu, two ku, are mentioned repeatedly. In the iconography, as we can see, palace ware forms are being used for the consumption of liquids and beverages. But why would you need two different forms to serve the same function? The answer is social practice. And, and, and cultural acceptability. You don't serve wine in a sippy cup and you don't put coffee in a champagne flute. You could. Functionally, those vessels will hold those liquids, but culturally and socially, we've all agreed that that's not the right beverage for the form. And I think that's what's going on here. In the home provinces, I think that palace ware form A was given to the imperial administrators as honor gifts at royal banquets in a material suitable to their rank. This was happened at the annual Ade ritual, which was a once a year ritual where everyone comes together, toasts the health of the king, repledges their loyalty to the king, and then they would leave with their palace ware vessel. Forms B and C, on the other hand, were used for the conspicuous consumption of grape wine, which would explain their shape and why no sieves or straws are associated with them. You see, grape wine impurities settle to the bottom. So the sedimentation on the bottom of the cup would be caught by the shape of the vessel itself. The other interesting thing, we don't think of it much, but grape wine is incredibly delicate. Um, wine does not preserve well in the ancient world, particularly before people started adding sulfates to it, which we can thank the Romans for. Uh, you know this, the Romans used to light their torches, stick them in the amphora, because then the sulfur would get in there. And that's how we started with adding the sulfur. But wines bruise easily. They don't travel well. They don't like changes in temperature. Ancient wines were probably really, really gross to drink. But they were also incredibly expensive and prestigious, particularly if you were living in a region where you couldn't grow grapes yourself. And somewhere around the 8th century, grape wine became a big deal in Assyria. That's when we get these Nimrud wine lists. We get carefully calculated distributions of who, which official gets how much wine and how many wine, how much wine is for the cups for the servants and how much wine is for this. And so it is a controlled substance that had an incredible amount of prestige, which might explain why the vessels are so small. So looking at the imperial administrative structure, there, there are several layers of power, and each of these layers of power um, had a, a different amount of grape wine that they are allowed access to, as well as probably a different material in which their, their cups and their jars were made out of. We have evidence of cups with uh, kings and queens names engraved on them in precious metals. Um, we have the second tier, the uh, like chief eunuch level 
um, bowls found with the names of provincial governors on them, and then we have the ceramic vessels. For our discussion, it's particularly important to think about what's going on in the provincial government, since we're looking at provincial narratives. Although at its height, the neo Assyrian provincial system extended across most of the Near East, there's much we don't know about it and how it functioned. Generally, each province had a governor appointed by the Assyrian king and selected particularly for his loyalty. In annexed provinces, the ideally the deputy, the person directly under the governor, was someone from the local community, a former ruler of the city before it was annexed. In annexed provinces also, the town and village mayors and possibly, I'm sorry, town and village inspector, inspectors and possibly even the village inspector and city overseers um, were also local former uh, members of the local government. If the integration into Assyria was peaceable, the remaining officers were likely held by Assyrian appointees of the home provinces because those would be, um, this is under, the major domo is responsible for several things, but the army being one of them. So all of these um, are different types of um, military branches in Assyria. So chances are those are going to stay within the Assyrian um, control, um, but they would have, held, have allowed uh, some of these other things to be annexed leaders. Now, this tier of person is the person I was saying once a year would go back to the imperial city itself and would um, undergo the Ade ritual, and in return for that fealty and loyalty would be given a bull. I think I have time for a little side note. I'm just going to tell you a cute little story. The brilliant thing about working in a literate culture is you get all these great little like personal anecdotes. So apparently one provincial governor was in a fight with another provincial governor and we have a letter in which he wrote to the king and said, I know you think that he's loyal, but he's not. He uses his bull as a toilet. <laughs> In unincorporated territories, who were probably things like vassal states um, and buffer zones, it's not that they weren't known to Assyria or under the influence of Assyria somehow. They simply weren't annexed officially into a province. The tribute, they would probably still also go once a year to pay tribute. So it's possible that some of these annexed people are, are coming in to, you know, people from these annexed areas sorry, unannexed areas, unincorporated territories are coming in with the people in annexed provinces and participating in this ritual as well. So what do I think about the story of palace wear in the home provinces? I think, practically speaking, they're drinking vessels. Form A, the social function are these honor gifts and their symbolic meaning is loyalty, loyalty to the God, loyalty to the king and loyalty to the land. Forms B and C, are also drinking vessels, but their particular social function is this conspicuous consumption of grape wine. The semiotic meaning would then be wealth, power, and prestige, because you could only be drinking grape wine if you were associated with that imperial elite who had access to the grape wine. So what does palaceware mean for its cultural audience, consumers, and producers in these annexed provinces? What are their narratives? So the narrative of Durkat Limu starts like this. Durkat Limu was located in the Rasapa or Nergal Erish province of the Neo-Assyrian Empire until the reign of Tiglath Pileser III in the late 8th century. For those of you who don't know Tiglath Pileser, he was a rather insecure man and so decided to redistribute power. Having a province this large near his imperial core made him incredibly nervous since the way he took over as king was a little sketchy. So to redistribute power and attempt to stabilize his southern empire, he divided Rasapa and Durkat Limu became part of Lake. The city itself served as a provincial capital during the Middle Assyrian period and would have housed a regional governor. It has a cuneiform archive. And during the late Assyrian period, it's probable that the role of Durkat Limu was 
that of some kind of administrative center, if not the provincial capital itself. This means that whoever was living in Durkat Limu would have been aware of this political instability, this relationship that once we'd all been together and then we were separated by the king. And I think that that concept plays a huge role in what we see going on with the palace wear here. Generally, the palace wear is similar to the palace wear from the home provinces in terms of their overall shape. However, they are more elaborately decorated than those in the home provinces. In addition, the vessels are subtly larger. They have longer necks and bodies. And yet, their overall capacity measurements stay pretty much the same. So they've managed to make things taller and bigger, more conspicuous, but they can't change that social value of those capacity measurements are important. And so those have been maintained, suggesting that the social function is requiring that same specific capacity, but that the symbolic or semiotic meaning of these vessels for its cultural audience required more elaborate presentation. The fabric is fine grained. It, it is fine grained. <laughs> um, and the, the difference in the trunk, I want you to see that. The difference in the truncation here, it's still highly truncated. It's just that the raw material started off um, chunkier. So there was more, there was more in it to work with. The fact that it isn't exactly the same fabric as the home provinces is just a reflection of this difference in, in raw material. The behavior of, of processing this raw material remained the same. In terms of color and firing temperature, the vessels at Durkat Limu are primarily that buff green that we find in the home provinces with a tendency toward being slightly redder. This may indicate that the producers of these vessels had less pyrotechnical expertise or that the color was not as meaningful a part of palace where social and symbolic value at Durkat Limu as it was in the central polity. So where are we with Durkat Limu and its narrative? The manufacture technology of palace wear at Durkat Limu is similar to that in the home provinces, particularly the reproduction of some of the more difficult, expensive, and unnecessary aspects of production, such as the wall thinness. Morphometrically, the vessels are different from those in the home provinces with bodies and necks larger than expected, while at the same time maintaining the socially significant capacity measurement. So while the social function appears to remain the same, and the meaning of these vessels, the value and meaning of these vessels is requiring a more elaborate presentation. They are more highly decorated. They're, they're bigger, not in terms of how much they hold, but physically they've made the vessels bigger and more incredibly decorated. So at Durkat Limu, I think the consumers of these vessels are the provincial administrators, probably from both the home provinces and the local elite. I think the governor probably was sent from central Assyria to Durkat Limu, and he and all of his provincial administrators were very aware that the king wasn't quite sure where their loyalty was at. The cultural audience was, of course, themselves and the provincial citizenry but also the Assyrian administration, their eye was on Assyria and they wanted Assyria's eye on them. Look at us, look at how conspicuously we are consuming this material culture showing off the wealth of Assyria um, through drinking the, the, the grape wine and as declaration of loyalty to the Assyrian king. So I think that it's the Assyrianness, the over Assyrianness, if you will, for the consumer that has the symbolic value, this affirmation of and participation in Assyrian power, building unity and a sense of identity among those administrators, um, as well as creating kind of I individual identification, maybe recognition and validation with the decoration. So our next narrative is that of Guzana, who has a very, very different relationship with Assyria. Guzana is located at the headwaters of the Khabur River in the northeast of Syria and served as a 
capital of the similarly named Neo-Assyrian province. However, in the cuneiform literature, it is always referred to by its Aramaic name, even after that Aramaic city-state, uh, Bit Bihani, became an official province in the 8th century. So this was Aramean, um, and the Arameans, remember, once occupied Assyria and took over all of Assyrian land. So this is an, Ara an Aramean city, state, and province that has become uh, Assyrian. It's laid out, the Assyrian city is laid out like every other Assyrian city that we see in the home provinces. So they came in and they established a provincial government and it looks exactly the same as it would if you were in Ashur, Nimrud, Nineveh. The palace ware at Guzana is similar to the palace ware at the home provinces in terms of overall shape, but they're generally plainer. The forms are, are devoid of the elaborate decoration. Morphometrically, they are slightly different from their counterparts in the home provinces, but they are well within the standard deviation expected from an individual workshop. They also preserve the culturally significant capacity measurements that we found in the home provinces. They're similar to vessels in the home provinces in terms of their overall manufacture behavior, but the vessels at Guzana are red, and they tend to be fired at a slightly lower temperature, suggesting that vessel color was not particularly meaningful to this cultural audience, or at least it wasn't the most meaningful part of its semiotic function for these consumers. So what is the palaceware narrative at Guzana? The manufacture technology is the same as palaceware in the home provinces. Generally, the morphometrics are the same as the home provinces, although there is some slight variation. The capacity of the vessels is the same as the home provinces, indicating a continuity in social practice. And although somewhat plainer, it appears the semiotic meaning of these vessels is consistent with that in the home provinces. So here it appears that palace wear has occurred here because of the consumers. Who are the Assyrian provincial administrators, all of whom are probably from the home provinces? The cultural audience is just themselves. They're not, they know that Assyria thinks they're loyal because the king's the one who put them all there. And they don't really want to show off being Assyrian because that will make them appear very alien to all of their Aramean people they are ruling over. That social function of the conspicuous consumption of great wine is still important. That is a reaffirmation of their power and their unity within the Neo-Assyrian imperial system. However, I think that that loss of decoration, the loss of flashiness is one, both because it's unnecessary, it's already conspicuous enough that they're doing an Assyrian thing in this Aramean province, but also because this is a whole group of men who may not like each other, who've been sent out into the middle of nowhere and have to live together in a potentially hostile environment. You don't want differences. You want to create a sense of unity. So if everyone's drinking from a plain vessel, no one can complain about the king liking them more or the, you know, governor liking them more, or it, it helps create a sense of unity. And our last narrative, the most perplexing of the bunch. On a provincial map of Assyria, Tel Gemma is down here in this unincorporated region of the Negev along the Gaza Petra trade route, about 10 kilometers southeast of modern Gaza city. The site is approximately five hectare, um, which is a pretty decent size for an ancient city and similar in size to the ones we've been talking about. Throughout its history, Tel Gemma sat at a cultural crossroads between Egypt and Mesopotamia, between Arabia and the Mediterranean. Despite appearing off the Neo-Assyrian provincial map, it's important to remember that this was not a backwater. This was a major, located along a major trade route. The palace wear styles at Gemma are primarily all type A bowls and are less palace wear stylish than just a Syrian style in general. Either way, it's interesting because the bowl forms are traditionally associated with imperial provincial administrative fealty and with the provincial system 
and loyalty to the Assyrian king. So why would an unincorporated city want to conspicuously demonstrate loyalty to Assyria? particularly since we know from the text that the Negev and Judah had a complicated and uneasy relationship with Assyria and continually throughout this time period were playing Assyria and Egypt off each other. It's unlikely then that these bulls were meant to impress Assyria with Gemma's loyalty. Besides, if the consumers of these bulls at Gemma wanted to impress the Assyrians with their loyalty, it would seem that they would want the vessels to look more similar to those in the home provinces. And these clearly don't. They're just general Assyrian in style and yet not that specific Assyrian palace wear style. So what then, if anything, are these bulls telling us about Gemma and its relationship to Assyria? What was their social function and symbolic meaning? The truth is I don't know. But I do know that it's not the same social function or semiotic function as it is in the home in the annexed provinces. And I think that if we look at a couple unique features of these vessels, it might get us closer to an answer. Many of the palace wear bowls at Tel Gemma were red slipped and burnished. This is not a typical finishing technique for Neo-Assyrian pottery in general, and it is never associated with palace wear. That buff green color is part of its social value. Um, they worked so hard to create it. It would be so much easier to create red pottery. Red slipping and burnishing are, however, very common in the southern Levant, and the combination of red slip, burnish, and thin walls during the Iron Age is indicative of a particular Levantine ceramic ware called Samaria ware. Samaria ware was a prestige good, and the combination of the finishing techniques on these Assyrian-style forms suggests that whatever the social value and function of these vessels was, it probably was related to status. The palace where bowls at Tel Gemma were also not fired as high as those in the home provinces, as indicated by their redder fabrics. In the home province, provinces, this layer level of vitrification would have created a kind of an impermeable uh, vessel fabric. So it's possible that at Gemma, these lower firing temperatures indicate that that particular performance characteristic wasn't important to the practical or social function of the vessels. Or perhaps it simply means the social value and meaning of these vessels was not related to their color or was related to a red color, hence the red slipping and burnishing. What is interesting is that most of the local pottery in the Negev has a green or buff rind that's related to a particular chemical reaction that happens during firing. So these vessels are, again, have a lot of uh, a calcareous fabric. And so some of the more mobile elements like chlorine um, and sodium will move to the surface of the vessel as it dries. When it's fired, that chlorine and, and sodium volatize and become gas and they pull iron with them. So you get this iron depleted rind across the top. So even if they wanted to, at a lower firing temperature, these potters would have known they could create this buff color. So it's not simply that they didn't have the pyrotechnology, it's they didn't, they didn't care. They didn't need it that color. I keep mentioning that palace ware was extremely fine grained and thin walled. And this is that micrograph of palace ware I showed before um, with no real significant inclusions. But I wanted to show you a picture of a palace ware style bowl from Tel Gemma, because that is also an incredibly fine-grained fabric. But you see the incredible difference in the number of inclusions. I mean, the, the fabric for the palace wear from the home provinces is just so distinctive. Um, being able to get it that fine, we call it fat, when it has that many silts and, and clay-sized particles in it and so few inclusions. You can also see that this material wasn't as well refined. So notice the difference in the profiles. This is a more natural profile. This is what we see most often in a sediment. We see a range of particles um, going toward the smaller particles instead of this clear truncation. And again, they're thicker. Um, still very thin compared to regular pottery, 
but not palace wear thin. And some of this wouldn't be significant if it weren't for the fact that palace wear were so incredibly standard in the way it's produced. So at Gemma, we have primarily Form A-ish bowls made using different manufacturing techniques than palace wear in the home provinces. The vessels are highly variable in their morphometric characteristics and often very different from the home provinces, particularly their capacity values, which are continuous and not broken apart into those discrete clusters that we've seen in the annexed and the home provinces, suggesting a completely different social function for these vessels. All of these characteristics together with the red slipping and burnishing indicate a completely different value and semionic meaning for these vessels in Telgema. So what's the Telgema narrative? Unlike forms B and C, the palaceware cups and jars, palaceware bowls are a more uniquely Neo-Assyrian form. They don't appear in Middle Assyrian assemblages. So I believe for the people at Tel Gemma, it was the uniqueness of the, this form that made it valued, independent and almost in spite of the social value and meaning it had for provincial Assyria. That is perhaps why these big bowls are bigger and more elaborately decorated. Despite not being officially annexed into the Neo-Assyrian Empire, the inhabitants at Tel Gemma were not backwater farmers. They were merchants and innkeepers along an international, interregional trade route, familiar with exotic goods and luxuries. They were politically savvy enough to play two world powers of the day off each other. I think that what we're seeing at Tel Gemma is a community who values the social identity of being considered cosmopolitan, both by themselves and by other cultural audiences. The bowl forms are the most conspicuous and unique of the three palace wear forms, and by modifying this form through red slip and burnish to be recognizable by a broader cultural audience as related to status, may indicate that it is this and only this that was valuable and meaningful at Tel Gemma. Thank you. Do we do questions? Yes? Sure. And maybe just because I don't understand volume and shape. But you said that in the uh, in some of the provinces, the the length of the neck was greater, and the and the length of the total vessel was greater, but the capacity was the same. The only way I can imagine that happening would be the walls were bigger. There wasn't that much variation. Right. So, so the maximum diameter, right, the maximum diameter stayed the same. They just increased the length. Yeah, so it, it's a, they're thinner. They're, yeah, narrower. So you've got, hold on. So you've got two measurements that go into capacity. got width right. and length. So if I just keep increasing this length, making this narrower and narrower, it's not really affecting the overall capacity, how much it can hold. So or I can move it in, the walls in slightly. The maximum, the maximum diameter changes. Right, slightly. And it's not a lot. It's not enough to be significant and show up as a flag in within the range, but it's just enough to make the neck, the necks in particular, which have nothing to do with capacity, get bigger. But yeah, it's a, it's tricky how they're making them look bigger, but they're keeping the capacities the same. It, it really was very sneaky. Yes. The picture of the ones that have the rounded, pointed bottom were there on the paper. Were there forms they sat in to keep them upright? Yeah, so, um, yeah, there is a picture of one of those right here. So there are these um, kind of holders that we see. They're, right, 
Right. And sometimes they have a central hole and then a whole bunch of holes around the outside for the cups. So you can see that they, they go as a set. And um, for the sake of time, I didn't go into a lot of the relationship between the form B and the form C. But I mean, they occur in, in these relationships like three to one, two to one. So one of the big forms will hold, you know, like four times what will fit in a cup. So it, you can see them as parts of these serving sets. But yeah, there were... Um, there were vessels designed to hold them. But another idea is some people only got a cup worth, only got a, a kasu worth of wine. And so having it in that shape, they couldn't take it away and give it to anyone else. They had to drink it and turn their cup over. They don't, but they, they you're right, they don't stand on their own. Mm -mm. Did, did they find areas or where the slip or the was gathered in order to make the vessels where it was mined or, or gathered from the, the materials yeah uh, in the home provinces yes, home no home what's home what's home tricky home about what's tricky about talking about archaeological pottery is modern pottery is all made from clay and they mean clay stricto senso as in minerals Clay is also a particle size in geology. So a lot of times the clays, most, most archaeological pottery isn't made out of clay minerals as such. It's made out of silt and clay-sized particles of rock that has become that small and, and sticks together. There are certainly clay minerals in it. but So that's the first little thing is it, there aren't clay beds necessarily. Um, they have not, so Iraq is an awkward place to work in. So, just gonna be honest. Uh, so going out and doing the kind of prospection ge geological work we would need to do to identify sources is, is awkward. What we do know is a lot about the Tigris, um, which is probably the river that's depositing most of the material. So the Tigris is flowing out of the Zagros, which is well studied geologically. Um, and when you can get the people who do hydrocarbon work to play well with you, you find out a lot about the geology of Iraq. But the Tigris is a very fast river. So it comes from the Zagros and it comes down through three different types of geology before it gets to where the Assyrians are. So it's both losing, it loses the majority of its load before it even reaches the cultural area, which is probably why we're starting with such a fine fabric and they're able to make it so much finer. Um, but it also means we don't have a lot in there that tells us where it comes from. Because most of the, it, mo most of the really diagnostic chemical signatures are come from the heavy minerals, the detrital minerals that get kind of carried along in the sediment. And this, this river moves fast and, and they're just gone. Um, so we don't have a lot. But my guess is it's Tigris, it's Tigris and foothills, Zagros foothills related material. Damn. Were any of these vessels You know, if you had asked me that three months ago, I would have said, no, they're always drab. But wouldn't you know it, someone found in the back of a museum one that's been painted. Not glazed, but painted. I don't know where, it has no provenance. It, it was in somebody's private collection and is now at the British Museum. So I know nothing about it. For, uh, for all I know, it could have been painted in the 1600s by a little kid. But there is one that has shown up painted. But, but no, the rest of them, the, the ones that have a, a good context, we know where they were excavated and who they were excavated by. They are all plain in terms of color. Do we know if these forms related in any way to any other decorative arts of the era, architecture, or um, The vessels themselves? Yeah. Not really. I mean, they show up in most of the, most of the art that's on um, the engravings and such that are on palace walls and administrative buildings are telling the story of the power of Assyria. Um, so everyday scenes, unlike in Egypt where they're busy telling everyday scenes because they have this 
um, ideology of, of afterlife, and it's important for these everyday scenes to be there so they continue in the afterlife. Assyria is all about power, all about power and diversity. So all of their scenes are showing um, either land being conquered, tribute being given, gods protecting the land. Um, so we don't get any everyday just people drinking scene. This this image is actually, there's a head. I don't know if you can, I think I might have cropped it. There's a head hanging in those great, in those vines. Um, this is a conquest scene, actually. This is the king coming home from a conquest and toasting his wife in the garden and the head of his enemy is hanging in the bushes, which I cropped off accidentally. So you can't see it. But so there's not, we don't have an idea of everyday life. And that's a problem with Assyrian and Mesopotamian archaeology, I would say, in general, is because of when people were able to do these excavations, archaeology and treasure hunting were, you know, pretty closely related. And so it was mostly temples and palaces that were excavated, which is fantastic because we have such a rich knowledge of religion and ideology. We know so little about the everyday person. I, you know, when we find out more, I may need to completely rewrite my book and say, this is all a bunch of crap. Everyone was using these things. This is just the way people drank goat's milk. I, but we just, we don't have that information. Well, we have some, um, you know, it's easier for me just to do this. So we know some things, like this is a chair back, you know, so, and, and we have chairs that are more or less intact because there's the ivory, you know, the ivory or the ebony legs, the ivory back, we're just missing, we're just missing the seat. So we have some archaeological remains that will, that confirm what we're seeing in the, uh, in the iconography. Um, we just, you know, when you, when you destroy a place, you take everything that's valuable, that's portable, and all of Assyria was destroyed in 612 by the Persians as they came up. So there's a lot of there's a lot of material culture we're missing. You know, we have no idea how much gold and how much silver and how much bronze were actually used because those metals are always melted down and reused. Um, so we're lucky when we find stuff, it's usually because it was in a burial that no one thought to look under the floor for, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one, uh, in terms of uh, samples that you about, yes, how many, how many pieces do you have that you looked at to make your story? Hundreds. As many as I could, as many, I took every vessel that was intact enough for all of my measurements at the British Museum, every vessel that was intact enough for my analysis at the Bordier de Attisha Museum, every vessel that was intact enough <laughs> from the Louvre. Um, so it was, yeah, it's, it's a smaller sample size than I'd, than I'd like, but it was everything that was out there because my rule was, I needed it. I needed to have a context for it. I needed, for a while I was, I, I, and it's a part of the analysis that I didn't talk about tonight, but sorry, I'm moving away from the mic. Um, I didn't talk about tonight, but I also analyzed where these vessels were located at the cities themselves. Were they in burials? Were they in domestic contexts? Were they in public contexts? So I needed material that had that kind of information. So there are private collectors in in London and in Germany who have large collections of palace ware, but I don't know where that material came from, so I didn't use it. So everything that was available I analyzed, but yeah, it, it comes down to hundreds. It's not thousands. The second question is about uh, making um, the materials themselves. You mentioned how uniform it is and mm -hmm. how, how quality. So there must have been special people mm -hmm. So is there anything in your, in your research to talk about the potters and yeah, so 
Uh, not necessarily about their, well, I guess it is related to their status. There, there's some kind of a guild structure. And I hate using the term guild because it makes everyone think of guilds like the medieval guilds. And it's a little different. So groups of workmen were assigned to different like households or functions. So temples had their own brewers, their own potters, their own bakers, um, who were producing things specifically for that institution. So it's not, it really wasn't a free market economy in the sense that there were just potters out there. When you needed something, you hired them. There were potters assigned to uh, different administrative and kind of big functions. I have no idea where the ever average person got their pottery, but we have texts talking about he didn't have the right he didn't have the right seal. He didn't have the right permissions to be working in this neighborhood. He didn't have that. Now, when it comes to palace wear, what we're thinking is there was probably a family or, or a guild that was obligated to make these. And there would be at least one person when that provincial household moved, there would need to be at least one person trained to throw these forms. Now, the forms themselves are really common. So those sharp angles. Um, are not the issue. Uh, once a potter learns a form, they can really easily produce multiple forms. The issue is the thinning and not tearing and that sort of thing. And again, you know, once you have one person, so it's a little sketchy, but we know that there were craftsmen and artisans that were trained in one particular thing and then assigned to administrative bureaus or, or functions. Um, so it's possible and probable that there was one like for the sweets maker or the baker or the brewer who was the palace wear person as opposed to the uh, tablet person or the brick person or the tableware person or beer jar person. Beer jars are another incredibly regularly standardized um, form. That's the best I can do. And most of that's based on the texts. So who knows what gaps are missing. Uh, yeah, um, um, if, uh, if you can answer it, um, uh, uh, is uh, the pottery of uh, a Syrian pottery um, uh, more functional or is it artistic? It is more utilitarian. It is by far more functional um, as a general rule. Um, a lot of the pottery is, if it's decorated, it's not decorated with bright colors. It's the um, it's these more subtle. Uh, like dimples here. Um, I'm trying to see if I've got any that have the engraving on them, and I don't. Um, sorry, that must be really difficult to watch me whip around through that, so close your eyes. So. Well, it's so thin and sizing it in any way of putting decorations on it, but perforated. Well, you know, somehow they managed to do it. I'm, the slide, you've got it on your sh on your sheet. If you look, <laughs> if you look on your handout, ah, here we go. If you look on your handout, you can see that sometimes there's these. Um, they look like little lines. So what we have are is evidence of a tool that was multi pronged, was flat and multi pronged, and so while it was on the wheel, they would turn it slowly, and it would just do this perfect. Um, in sizing of lines. So that's typical of all Assyrian pottery, all the tablewares, the beer jars. If they have any kind of decorative element, um, it's something basic and something that was applied or carved into the vessel. They're generally speaking, they're not decorated. Oh, okay. Except in the palaces. So I did. It wasn't uh, intentional. Yeah. They're, it's mostly utilitarian. The, as much as the Assyrians are about this conspicuous consumption, um, when it comes to doing everyday things, they're pretty down to earth. Any other questions? Yep. Um, yeah, most of them are still inhabited. Um, one of the one of the problems with um, working anywhere, even in the the Near East, as opposed to just the Middle East, is these are the ancient sites are located in fantastic locations. Between you know, Assyrian sites always have at least two rivers, and one river that comes in through where they've built the wall around. 
up high. You know, they were prime locations back then in this rather difficult landscape to live on, and they're prime locations now. So there's, an, for example, there's an Assyrian fortress, an Assyrian outpost in Gaza. We can see the wall outline, but to get to excavate it, we would have to go through so many levels of concrete. There are people living there, and where do you put the people to excavate? So it's, it's a problem. Um, of all archaeology, but particularly in the Near East, where land is at such a premium, land that's livable is at such a premium. Hi, Jordan. So, all of the Semitic languages. So that would include um, all the Akkadian languages. So that's Babylonian, Sumerian and Assyrian, and then the dialects, the neo-dialects, which are slightly different, um, Ugaritic. Uh, you need a little bit of Arabic just because there's so much secondary literature <laughs> written in Arabic. Um, German and French, because those are the academic languages of Assyriology. Um, but of the ancient languages, all those Semitic languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, Ugaritic, um, Babylonian, Sumerian, and Akkadian. It depends on what your question is. It depends on what you want to do. So I, I am looking particularly at um, kind of higher level issues where I want to understand. I need to read different types of texts. I want to read the administrative texts, but I don't just want to read what the Assyrians say about themselves. I want to read what the Hurrians are saying about the Assyrians, and I want to read what the Arameans are saying about the Assyrians. So perhaps as an archaeologist, if I only was asking questions that dealt with something local I wouldn't need to but it was such a an international world you know it's a bit like um, it's a bit like only knowing English and traveling around Europe <laughs> I do well, I don't have access in the same way. Um, so I work with published texts. I don't, I'm not a linguist, so I would never take an unpublished text and translate it and transliterate it on my own. I take someone else's transliteration and then compare it to the tablet and say, oh, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm good with that. And then I look at their translation and say, yeah, I don't like the way they're doing that word. Let me do something else. So I use the text differently, and I primarily work with published texts. The brilliant thing is most of these texts are online. There's a lot of money to put the cuneiform texts themselves online in a searchable database. But in terms of library access, yes, I miss the British Museum being a block away. Absolutely. It's just stunning with this capacity for languages is often separate from the capacity for science, basically. I think they're both puzzles. To me, they're both puzzles. Working on a cuneiform text because it's syllabic, so that's another that's another puzzle in and of itself. It's not it's not an alphabetic language, so one sound can have like six signs. So you know, and one sign can sometimes have multiple sounds. So figuring out it's 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 a bit like a game. So to me, language study always felt like the puzzles I'm solving at CIS. You know. Um, but I say that, and my husband, who is a true linguist, who is a true Assyriologist, can't put together something from Ikea. So I, I, it's a weird thing, but I can do it. <laughs> but to me, it's a game. It's the challenge. It's the puzzle of the languages, I think. And where did you apply that knowledge? I have a master's in ancient Near Eastern languages from Fuller Theological Seminary in Los Angeles. I thought of, I wanted to work with Liz Carter at UCLA, but they didn't do the broad range of languages um, that I could get at Fuller. I know. The nice thing about languages in one family is once you learn one, it the, makes the acquisition of the other languages easier. It's, I mean, that's the lie they told us all in high school about the Romance languages, right? But it really is true with Semitic languages. The sounds are the same. The words sound the same. They're just written using different characters. Um, but 
you know, words for, uh, like we just got a puppy and, and the word for puppy is a Muranu. So my puppy is Murani. And that is true in Assyrian and Babylonian and Sumerian and in Ugaritic, that Muranu sound, the, the, that those two syllables, even though they're written differently alphabetically in Ugaritic, the sound stays the same in the other languages. So there's a lot of words that are the same. They just have a different script, if you will. Anything else? So how do you search cuneiform languages <laughs> online? You have to look through transliteration. It's probably not the easiest thing for someone who doesn't know what they're looking for. So, But you go to the State Archives of Assyria Bulletin, and they have all of the State Archives of Assyria Bulletin online, and you type in either your English term or your Akkadian term, and it will pull up all of the times that term is used in the bulletin. So, um, so someone has been through it before and translated it. Yes. Yeah, these are all published. You can't search, you know, there's a lot of unpublished stuff, so this is only what's been, only what, what's searchable is only what's been published. So I would say State Archives of Assyria is the best place to go. There is also the Oriental Institute, and I think UCLA have databases as well. UCLA's, I believe, is for Sumerian, which I don't recommend you learn to read. If you're going to learn to read one of these, start with something easier that has more texts, like Akkadian. Um, actually, the easiest one to start with is Ugaritic between you and me because it's alphabetic. So it's an easy way to get into looking at cuneiform and starting to read the language um, and then moving on to, to Akkadian. In case you were in case you wanted to study Ugaritic, <laughs> study these languages, but that's how you would do it. But there are they're all published texts, but they're they are out there. Anything else? Great. Well, thank you for your attention.